the author's shelf. The author's shelf. On today's show, on today's Christmas edition of the Author Shelf, we'll be chatting with Paul Collins, who's not only an author of children's, young adults and adults books, he's also a publisher at Ford Street Publishing and runs the Creative Net Agency, which facilitates author and illustrator participations in schools, libraries, conferences and festivals. So sit back and relax as we bring you the stories beyond the page. You're listening to the Author Shelf on 2SSR 99.7 FM, Sound of the Shire. Coming up next... Paul Collins. Now it's time to welcome my guest on today's show. Paul Collins is a highly successful author who is best known for his fantasy and science fiction titles. He's authored over 140 books both here and overseas. Paul is not only an award-winning author, he's also a publisher with Ford Street Publishing, a company he started and has worked hard to ensure it is the force it is today. Paul strongly believes in nurturing Australian talent and it's selflessly dedicated his time to ensuring children, and continue to be challenged and entertained by their reading choices. Ford Street Publishing have many celebrated authors under their wings, such as Suzanne Gervais, George Ivanoff, who happens to be our guest on our next show, Michael Salmon and Tanya McCartney, just to name a few. Paul, Paul also to Paul's credit, is the Speakers Agency Creative Net, which is set up to facilitate author and illustrate participation in schools, libraries, conferences and festivals. Here to tell us all this about all this and more is the very talented author... Paul Collins. Paul, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Georgie. Tell us what, you, you certainly have many feathers to your cap, Paul. Tell us what is, what is your story? Well, that's about a 40-year story, <laughs> so in less than a minute. Um, I always wanted to be self-employed, so my first few jobs when I left school at 15 <clears throat> included working in factories and things like that, and <clears throat> in the end I thought to myself, well, okay, how am I going to break this mould? So I started up publishing. I didn't actually start out as a reader, um, unlike a great many authors, especially children's authors like Meredith Costain, Michael Pryor, Eddie Griffiths, John Mars, Michael Joe Bell, there's a staff of them. Um, they were teachers, they were avid readers since the age of nine or ten. I was only reading comics. So when I was about 18, I thought, well, how hard can this be? Because I'd read a lot of Marvel comics. So a lot of people have said in... In, uh, reviews of my work that it's very visual and I think that's true because of my Marvel group um, upbringing. So at about the age of 18 I, I wrote a, a Western novel and I had quite good fun doing it actually. I, I wrote two Western novels, one of which um, I, pu I published myself. So I did self-publish which was a huge mistake, that's another story. Uh, I then went on to publishing a science fiction magazine called Void. It was the only science fiction magazine um, in Australia at the time. Um, that evolved into anthologies, um, so I published about five or six anthologies of science fiction and fantasy, and I, I went on then in the early 80s to publish Australia's first um, heroic epic fantasy novels So for adults, so all the authors you see today like Garth Nix, Isabel Carmody, Trudy, Canavan, etc., well, they, they weren't exactly around in the early 80s, so um, I was publishing fantasy and science fiction back then. I, I think I did about 16 books. Unfortunately for me, I had two um, distributors, um, and they both folded. One disappeared altogether um, with my last book, which was A. Bertram Chandler's um, last novel, uh, The Wild Ones, it was called, and owed me a lot of money. At that point, I thought, ah, this is too hard. <laughs> so I, I started writing, and I wrote a lot of short stories, I think probably well over 100 short stories. And uh, my first novel was The Wizard's Torment in um, 1995 by HarperCollins published it. And um, since then, yeah, quite a few books have followed. Um, in 2007, uh, Macmillan said that they would distribute me if I was publishing children's books, and uh, that's when I started um, publishing again, uh, only children's books, of course, with um, Justin Darth's Pool and um, Sean McMullen's um, uh, first novel, uh, Before the Storm, first the YA novel, should I say. So, um, yeah, I've been going uh, since 2007 as a publisher. Right. That, that, um, so how, how do you come up with your story ideas? So you've got quite a range of different, different genre, genres that you've written for. How do you come up with your, your stories? 
Okay, some of them, the, um, I've written a lot of chapter books, mostly for education, and some of them are trade, but um, chapter books are those sort of two, three thousand worders, there may be 50 odd pages, 52 pages or something. Um, I wrote one called Pit Stop, which came from um, an article in a paper I read, and I sort of fictionalised it. Uh, Flying High was another book that uh, um, someone told me, they gave me a one-liner actually, they said, um, this woman told me her nephew and niece built a BMX track during the school holidays, and I thought, now there's an idea for a novel. Uh, fantasy and science fiction, sheer imagination, of course. It, it follows on the what if, what if this happened, and away you go. You just um, <laughs> you run with it. I lo- yeah, I love the what if. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, as you said, you've written you've written a few well, you've written a few series a series books. Now, a, a series hard to write because I always hear from publishers, and you can speak for this because you wear the two hats. They always say that. Series are great, but you're only as good as your last book. So if you have, you know, three in a series and you put out the first book and it doesn't do very well, what what happens? Because you've left content for two and three. So how do you get round that enough to keep the reader interested to come back for, you know, the next book and perhaps the one after that um, without giving too much away in the first book? H- how do you get round that? Well, there's various uh, methods of writing um, for series. Uh, for instance, with the Quintaris Chronicles, uh, Michael Pryor and I got together, um, this is well, years ago now, and um, we got a world together. It's a shared world, they're called. And where you get two editors, they get together, they create the world and create all the people in the world, and you hand that um, whole concept over to another author. So we did that, and we had Isabel Carmody, Gary Crew, they both wrote two books each in the Quintaris Chronicles. Margot Lanigan, um, Holst, Justin Darth, stack of authors, um, John Heffernan. Uh, I think we, we published about 33 of those novels. Now, they were all standalone, so we didn't have the problem of um, getting a person back the next time because anyone who read, say, book one, book ten, book eight, all out of order, it didn't matter. It, it depended on the quality of the book. But they knew that um, if they didn't like one book, hey, you know, if they liked the world of Quintaris, they'd come back and um, choose another author who also wrote. So that's a standalone series. Um, with the Earthborn Wars, um, I only wrote the Earthborn as a single book, and it sold to um, Tor, which is maybe one of the biggest, if not the biggest, science fiction publisher in, in the world, or the Western world. Um, so they published that, and they asked me for a sequel. So then I had to sort of think, oh, okay, um, <laughs> we've got aliens coming down to the planet Earth. Okay, so we'll, we'll do it from the alien perspective. And then, of course, another alien race comes, and um, then the the first two lots, the Earthborn and the Skyborn, join forces to fight the Hydeborn. So that was the third book. So really they weren't written as a series as such, even though um, the Earthborn was a trilogy. Um, with the, the Jalindal Chronicles, the, the first book, Dragon Links, that was written as a standalone uh, with the idea of two and three. But when I sold it to Penguin Books, they wouldn't commit to a trilogy because they wanted to see how the first book went. So Dragonlinks went well enough for them to say, yeah, okay, we'll take book two. But of course, unbeknown to them, I had actually left some loose ends in Dragonlinks so I could continue on with the second book. Um, And the same with the third book, um, or the second book, they didn't want to commit to a third book, and Dragon's Fang was the second book in the Jalindal Chronicles. That sold well enough enough for them to want a third book, and so on and so forth. In in the end, there were four books in the uh, Jalindal Chronicles. But I didn't actually write, I mean, the the way to do it really is to plan it all out. Um, like I've written another series called The Maximus Black Files, it's science fiction, and that was planned out book by book because I knew I wanted this as a, as a trilogy. So I had to make sure you've got enough hooks for people to want to read on to the second and then the third book. Yes, of course, if you, if you bomb out in the second book or the first book, then the other books aren't going to get published anyway. And it's going to be very hard, authors know, to sell uh, book two or three of a series to another publisher when another publisher has already published the first one or two books. So uh, a lot of time involved in writing a trilogy. It could take you two years, and um, you really want those three books to be published. (laughs) Well, you need to tell the whole story, so yes, you you do. Yeah. So very, very um, useful advice there. Thank you very much, Paul. We're going to come back after, just going to take a short break, and we'll be back with with Paul in just, just a minute. 2 supporting Australian talent. Now back to my guest, Paul Collins. Paul, I mentioned you have written for different genres. How effortlessly do you change between them? 
Well, really, it's a, the same as publishing. I think you uh, you have deadlines, and it's a matter of changing one to the other. So if you're writing a series of chapter books for, say, Macmillan, uh, you'll, you'll do as much as you can on them, and if you know you've got another deadline coming up with something else, then you, you swap. And uh, with publishing, it's the same thing. Right now, I'm working on a, an Archie Fusillo book that really needs to get to the printer very quickly. And uh, at the same time, I've got other things that really I should be doing as well, but they're, um, they just have to take the second seat. And uh, it's the same way with writing. So they, they sort of cross over on, on that one. Now, you mentioned uh, publishers there. That's that's a good lead into my next question. Um, you have a publishing company, Ford Street Publishing. Tell us a little bit about Ford Street Okay, well, we, we publish everything from children's picture books through to um, young adults. I think this coming, like 2014, I think I have way more picture books coming out than I do novels. I only have two novels, but about eight picture books so far. So that does take up a, a fair amount of time. And some of the some of the authors that I've published, um, Hazel Edwards, Isabel Carmody, James Roy, Gary Coo, Suzanne Gervais, Justin Dart, and of course, as I said, I've got Archie Fusello coming up. I think we've published, um, I always say we, it's the royal we, by the way. <laughs> I, I do have the lovely uh, Gemma coming in one, one day a week, actually, who helps me. But um, other than that, and my partner, Meredith Costain, who um, sometimes gives me a hand, especially with picture books. She's my in-house expert on uh, picture books. I, I received Meredith's new book the other day, actually. So I'll be reviewing that on Creative Kids Tales next month. Very excited. Ah, Excellent. My first day at school. Yes, my first day at school. In fact, my, my seven-year-old has already read it and she said, hmm, very interesting. So I know it's a good book when she says, hmm, very interesting. I might have to get her to write the review, actually. Are you your daughter? Yes, my yeah. seven-year-old daughter. Excellent. Anyway, sure Meredith will be thrilled. Okay, we'll look out for that next month on Creative Kids Tales. If you'd like to interact with us during the show, you can send us a message via our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the author's shelf, or you can tweet us at the author's shelf. My guest today is Paul Collins. Paul, you tend to publish books that aren't afraid to address, I guess, the more grittier issues. What What are some of the books that you've published? I think the most controversial would be F2M by Hazel Edwards and Ryan Kennedy, which is about transgender. In fact, it was the first book in the world, I think, actually co-written by a transgender person, Ryan Kennedy. Um, the character Sky presents as a male, and her family finds difficulty coming to terms with uh, losing their daughter. So it obviously has themes of acceptance, search for identity, um, sex change, etc. Um, I know one reviewer said it should be in every school library and um, municipal library in the country. Um, I, I do know a little anecdotal uh, story here. Hazel was in, in a class once and a teacher actually threw the book in a bin. And I think that's the problem we have with um, people putting their heads in the, in the sand about controversial issues. They um, they don't like the look of a book. They're just going to rather not know about it. Um, I published another book called uh, Crossing the Line by Di Bates. And um, schools told her they, they didn't want her going in there talking about these issues because they didn't have the means to support the students, like the staff. And, and Crossing the Line was about self-harm which is quite incredible when you think about it. It's like we don't want to know that any of our kids are, <laughs> uh, have got self-harm issues. Um, I'm sure because Di went through this herself when she was younger, and, and it's a great book. It was shortlisted for the New South Wales Premier's Award, so um, you know it's, it's a quality book. But um, no, they, they didn't want her going in there. Um, a lot of schools just said no for that, for that reason. They didn't have counsellors or whatever to um, you know, uh, handle that issue. But um, other books, um, I, I published uh, The Glass House, which was a picture book that I wrote, actually, um, and that has fear, isolation, paranoia, uh, perfection and survival themes. And, and that actually came from a true life experience, but obviously it, it's a metaphor. You, you can't talk about the true life experience. You use the picture book as, as a metaphor. Um, to give an example of that, if, if I may, do I have time just to read out a, a quick review? Absolutely. Okay, um, not not of the, uh, the glass house. This is about uh, Big and Me, and this was a, a book about um, mental issues. And Tina Ratha Mulligan wrote uh, a review in the Sound Telegraph, and she can tell the story better than me, I think. So I'll just read this out. It's only a few paragraphs. Big and small work together on construction projects, and they are usually a good team. But sometimes Big goes a bit wobbly, and his friend gets a lot worried. The mechanic identifies Big's computer as the problem. 
doesn't always work properly, so he needs to take tractor medicine every day to fix him up. Trouble is, that makes Big think he's better and doesn't need to take it, which of course means things go wrong again and he has to go to the workshop for a while. Mental illness can be difficult to explain to young children and David Miller has come up with a simple, non-threatening way to help them understand this growing social issue. The toy-like endearing quality of the machines in the illustrations complements the text beautifully and eliminates the fear factor. Children will find it easy to embrace both the characters and the important message. Big and Me would be an excellent starting point for discussion when there is a relative or friend whose behaviour could need explanation to a child. And I think that's the strength of these picture books that uh, use metaphors. Um, talking from true life experience, but they, they actually, it, it's a good book anyway. Whether you get those references or not, it's, it's a picture book that kids will enjoy. But it, it's so much more, it, it's multi layered. It's sad that schools don't take on a lot of these books because, as you said, they can't deal with these issues. When, when so much of these issues are in everyday children's or teenagers' lives. So hopefully with, with more books out there, we can, we can help change that, that pattern that, that teachers you know, find the quick, easy way out, just throwing it in the bin. Yeah. Oh, that's not always the, the case, of course. <laughs> not, not always. Not, and, yeah. and I should say, not all teachers, but some, some schools, yes, do. Rather than, than address those issues, the, the easiest way is, well, we, we don't have the resources, so just let's not talk about it. Well, you know, I, I published a, a book by um, Sue Bistinsky called Crime Time. It was basically a uh, compliment to, um, <clears throat> I think Penguin published 50 famous Australians, so I thought, oh, well, I'll do a 50 notorious <laughs> um, Australians, and it had Ned Kelly and all the obvious ones. And the subtitle of Crime Time was Australians Behaving Badly. Now, this was on the uh, poster. I did this big poster. I sent it to schools free. And a librarian um, contacted me and said, please take me off your database. And I just got back to her. I said, why? You know, I'm thinking, God, what have I done wrong? And she said, you're trivialising crime. I thought, how can I be trivialising crime by a subtitle on a book? It's only one book, you know. Mm. So, in other words, she was the head librarian of a school that had about a thousand students. Um, so, Fourth Street merchandise, you know, the books and everything won't go into that school because one person has this sort of narrow mind that um, some subtitle means some major thing, which it doesn't. That, yeah, as I said. That's, the, that's the problem we're facing, yeah. Yeah. Well, now, now, Ford Street isn't actively open to submissions, so where do you get your submissions from, for, from authors? Um, well, quite often we might get a second book in from an author. I mean, Suzanne Gervais, for instance, um, I'm publishing her third book with Anna, Anna Pignataro this time uh, next year, Elephants Have Wings. So um, I've got DC Green. I published his Monster School this year. He's um, sending me another one for next year, like book two. So with the Quintaris Chronicles, obviously, that just went on. Um, individual books came in. So sometimes it it's, goes back to whoever I've, I've already published, um, especially if I know someone's um, selling well and, um, you know, I get on with them and, you know, the, the, the book is good. I mean, that's the main thing, as long as the, the book is good. So that's where I do get a fair bit of... Um, so Tanya McCartney, of course, with her Riley books, I've published two of those and we might have another one of those in 2014. Um, some people do send me stuff as well, like unsolicited material. Unfortunately, I do have a pile right here. <laughs> I, I actually published 19 books this year, and for one person, um, that, that's quite a few. That's huge. So um, that's the main reason I, I put, I'm closed to submissions, simply not, not because I don't want to give new people a chance. I have published quite a few first-time authors. Um, it's just that I can't get around to them, and I, I just feel so guilty. I've got this pile here and I just can't get to them at the moment. Well, don't, don't feel guilty. We love, <laughs> we love Ford Street Publishing. We love the books that come out. So don't feel guilty at all. What, what helps in your decision to publish someone? Do you, do you favor an already published author or someone who perhaps has an online presence? Is it, is it an all round package for you or what's, what's the secret? I think a bit of all of that really. I mean, if, if I can get a package, if I can get um, a good book, a book that I really like and, um, I know the author self-promotes and they're going to really do a good job, um, then I'm, I'm more likely to take it on than, say, someone I don't know. I don't know whether they're going to promote a book. And we're going along the lines of if you've got two books and they're identical or they're, they're equal to one another, right. you're obviously going to take the one from the author you know, who's got yes. a track record, and um, you know they're going to self-promote the book and, and uh, it's going to sell well, rather than take a punt on someone who uh, you don't know. 
So, I mean, the person you don't know, if, if their book is better, then you'd probably take the punt and do that rather than the other way around. Being a small press, um, you know, 19 books, I'm, I'm sworn blind that I'm not going to publish 19 this, uh, in 2014. So I'm really trying to sort of hold down. I think I've got about 12 books committed right now, right. which is even more than I was hoping to uh, to publish. I'll go on, Paul. Go for 20. <laughs> yeah, no. Nah. But we're not going to afford to employ someone that. Okay. All right, uh, everyone, buy Ford Street Books so Paul can produce more books, publish uh, more books. Thanks, Georgie. <laughs> It's a good plug there. Um, this is this is not a paid interview, by the way. Uh, I just want to throw that in. Um, Creative Net. Now, Creative Net. That's another hat that you wear. Tell tell us a little bit about Creative Net. Okay. Initially, I, I set up um, the speakers agency because a lot of the the first time authors or reasonably unknown authors I, I was publishing couldn't get represented um, in a booking agency. They they were just getting knocked back. So I thought, well, okay. I do have a huge database of librarians. I've, I've been working in schools myself as an author for a long time, and I've kept all these contacts. So I thought, well, okay, I'll set up an agency for all the people that I'm actually publishing. And, of course, it's, I soon realized that no one was going to go to a website with mostly unknown people. So I spread the net wide and um, contacted everyone I know, and I, I must know at least a couple of hundred authors and illustrators, and said, uh, would you like to come on Creative Net? And uh, a lot of people like Lee Hobbs, uh, Michael Salmon, Isabel Carmody, a lot of people came on board. So I've got about 130 um, people I represent now, authors and illustrators. And schools, uh, well, librarians, municipal and school librarians call us and festivals. And um, it's, for me, it's really only a matter of liaising between two people and it doesn't take much of my time. You can do it in about 10 minutes flat. Um, our point of difference, too, is that I don't charge a booking fee which is quite unique. Um, most agents, if not all of the other agents, charge um, quite a hefty booking fee to, to book these people, which I don't do because what I'm getting out of it is publicity for Ford Street and, of course, um, I'm getting my authors into into schools, which they promote the books. So that's what I get. Which is what it's all about. For me. <laughs> that, that, no, and, and, and also getting the authors out there into schools. And, and I know schools, funds, schools funding is tight, so... You know, every little bit helps, so that, that's great that you're doing that. Now, Paul, can you tell us a little bit about The Beckoning? What, what was the outline that you gave to the publisher? Okay, the um, Damnation Books in the US uh, published the book. Uh, I have to admit that it was written about 25 years ago. Um, it's been saved on various devices such as floppy disk, zip drives, USB sticks and other things I've even forgotten. And uh, finally I saw that they were looking for um, horror novels. And as you know, I, I write for children these days, but I, I did write a couple of horror novels. I also wrote a book called The Housewarming, in case there are any publishers out there <laughs> after another book. Um, but okay, the, the outline I sent to Damnation Books was uh, was basically this. It was a bit longer, but I'll, I've cut it down a bit. Driven to despair, the Brannigans moved to Warrnambool. Trouble isn't far behind. Unbeknown to the family, a religious guru by the name of Brother Desmond has lured them to Warrnambool, where he has set up headquarters, his Zarathustrans, Follow the principles espoused by Nietzsche. Brother Desmond knows that the power within Bryony Brannigan is the remaining key he needs to enter the next dimension. With her power in his control, he would have access to all that is presently denied him. He conjures a being that unleashes a cold snap and murders Matt's wife. Luckily for Matt, he's out on the night, uh, letting off steam with vulnerable heavyweights. He arrives home to find his daughter collapsed at the bottom of the stairs and his wife's frozen body. Bryony is led into the sect by Brother Desmond's disciples. She is easily manipulated, or so the Zarathustrans believe. Matt calls on Clarissa Pike, a journalist and former psychic friend of his wife's. Together they gain access to Modewood, only to find they're in way over their heads. Better prepared with psychic shields and other protection devices, they enter Modewood under the cover of darkness, and there begins a fight to the death with Brother Desmond's Legion of the Undead. So that was basically the, the outline I sent them. Very, very exciting there. We'll have to, where can we get a copy of The Beckoning, Paul? Uh, Amazon.com, um, Booktopia, I think. Basically any uh, online, online, um, seller, bookseller. Or it's, it's print on demand and, um, uh, ebook and Moby. So it's Kindle and, and um, ePub. Excellent. Or you can try and win a copy on the author's shelf on our Facebook page. Pop over and, and have a look for that. We're going to chat with more with Paul in just a minute. I'm Georgie Donahue. You're listening to the author's shelf on 2 SR 99.7, Sound of the Shire. Thanks for joining me again this afternoon, Paul. What 
advice would you give to someone who's about to submit their work to a publisher for the first time? I think ensure that the, the manuscript is as professional as they can uh, present it. So no errors, um, the, the story itself is structurally sound and tightly written, and basically cross your fingers. But um, it helps, I think, to, to go to a writer's centre if you don't know how to lay out manuscripts and actually do a one-day or two-day course and just to see how it's all presented. I, I think, personally think the presentation is is quite important. Some people would argue that it doesn't matter how you present it. If it's a good story, it should be published. But the reality is publishers sometimes get up to 2,000 manuscripts a year and if they just see something with no paragraphing, no proper sentence structure, etc., they'll just think, oh, God, it's another one of those. They might read the first paragraph and flick it into the, um, the, the rejection pile. So, um, but, yeah, presentation is the, the main thing, I think. Thank you. Very useful advice. Paul, tell me, you've got a book launch coming up soon. Tell us a, very quickly about that. Okay, um, it's on the 21st of this month, uh, 1 p.m. or 1.30 p.m. at the Richmond Library, 415 Church Street, Richmond, Victoria. And uh, I'm also launching The Only Game in the Galaxy, which is book three in the Maximus Black Files. And I did actually order print versions of The Beckoning from uh, Amazon, so I will actually have the print version at the launch on the 21st. Oh, very exciting. Now, don't forget if you, uh, don't forget this week's giveaway for your chance to win a copy of Paul's book, The, The Beckoning, the ebook version. Pop over to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the author shelf and tell us what's the scariest book you've read. We'll pick a winner and announce them on our final show for the year. And also, if you're an emerging children's author or illustrator and are looking for somewhere to display your work, why not visit creativekidstales.com.au? There you'll find a complete publisher's listing, including Ford Street Publishing, competition information, writing tips, and a whole lot more. It's a great site to assist you on your journey to publication. Thank you, Paul Collins, for joining us on our Christmas show today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, yeah, Georgie. And I've got one last tune to play for, for our show today. If you'd like more information about Paul, Ford Street Publishing, or CreativeNet, visit his website, paulcollins.com.au, and that's Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S. Dot com dot au. Well, that's just about it.